Welcome to Most Innovative Companies. I'm your host, Yasmin Gagne, joined by my producer, Josh Christensen. Hey, Yas. Josh, we have a huge guest on today. Huge. I'm so excited. So I don't think we want to bore our listeners with our banter right now. No one wants to hear from us. Let's just get right into it. I just have a quick piece of housekeeping. because You're going to want to do this after you listen to today's episode, which mm-hmm. is subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Go on Apple Podcasts. If you haven't already followed, hit that follow button and leave us a rating. So we have a very special guest in our studio today, someone we've interviewed at Fast Company before, back in 2017. I don't know if you remember. Of course. Mm -hmm. I remember that photo shoot, actually. (laughs) But never for the podcast. Our readers get to hear your voice. Oh, lucky them. (laughs) We're (laughs) excited to welcome actor, producer, and entrepreneur Issa Rae to the show. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. (laughs) (laughs) I'm pretty sure that readers have heard your voice before. It's pretty popular. Well, I hope so. Oh, I have nothing to say to that. (laughs) I have nothing to contribute. So today, I think it's literally the day this podcast comes out. You're launching your own Prosecco. I am. My dream has come (laughs) true. I have a Prosecco out, and it's called Via Ray. So you got the nice pun with your name. I know. This is the last time, I promise. I'm like, I feel like I'm stretching it out. (laughs) Well, I read that you rebranded from Issa Ray Productions to Hooray, which I think is really funny. I stole that from my aunt, so I'm actually named after my middle name. My name is Ray, and I'm I'm named after my aunt, who is an artist, and she used to have this company, Hooray for the Arts. And so, you know, she passed, but I got to, like, live on through her with yes. Hooray. I always thought it was clever. I was like, ah, yeah, that's I think that's good. your name. That's amazing. So, Issa, before I even ask you about developing V Hooray, what kind of drunk are you? Oh, <laughs> I have gotten better. You know, my friends actually named my drunk alter ego Ursula. <laughs> They said I was very evil, very mean. Like, that would come out. Yeah. I can't imagine that. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. But I think I just wanted conflict. And that's what they would be like, oh, Ursula's here. (laughs) Do you keep trying to make deals with people? Like, I'll give you some legs for your voice. Yeah. I think that was the gist of it. It's a very weird (laughs) drunk to be. (laughs) What can you do for me? And I can, you know. (laughs) Which is actually, that's accurate. But no, my friend just complimented me. He was like, I haven't seen Ursula in, like, decades. So That's growth. Josh, what kind of drunk are you? Oh, I'm boring. I'm just a sleepy drunk. Sleepy drunk? Yeah. Yeah. Falling asleep with the functions type drunk. Yeah, that kind of drunk. That's me. Uh, I gotta keep it. I gotta keep it down or caffeinate heavily beforehand, and then it's like two Aperol spritzes, uh, which I need to try with the new brand. With the new prosecco, yes, absolutely. Um, But that's about it. (laughs) But they say that like tequila is an upper. So what is your what is your do you drink tequila or have you? God, no, not anymore. Tequila, (laughs) tequila is rough. It just makes me like queasy. It's too much. Why Prosecco? Because Prosecco has been my signature drink for a while. I associate it with, like, my best moments and kind of my come up, you know. Like, I first was introduced to it by Melina Matsukis, the director of The oh, yeah, Insecure but... Pilot. Yes, mm. went to, like, a getting to know you dinner right before she... Oh, that's awesome. I interviewed her for the magazine oh, a couple, year, couple of years ago. So you know how incredible she is. Yeah, she's so cool. She's such a hero <laughs> of mine. And, we, yeah, we were out for sushi. She ordered it. And I was like, what is that? She was like, you'll see. And <laughs> it was basically like, to me, an approachable champagne because champagne just felt too like highbrow. Like I didn't yeah. I, mean, I didn't feel like esteemed enough or accomplished <laughs> enough for, for champagne. And Prosecco was approachably luxurious. Yeah. And so, yeah, I was just like, I want my I want my own. Like I kept on recommending it to people. <laughs> I introduced it to my friend group. And I was like, I need to stand behind what I'm promoting. So I, like, why not create one that has a flavor profile that I can stand behind and that I love and that I won't get tired of. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you reach out to Gallo, the yes, wine people? Really? I did. <laughs> First of all, I took a lot of meetings with different people. And, mm-hmm. you know, some of them were just like, why Prosecco? Can it be this? And I'm <laughs> yeah. just like, no, it has to be Prosecco. Mm. And Gallo just got it. You know, working with them has been an absolute dream. That's awesome. You know, it's funny. Some celebrities have alcohol brands like I think JLo famously does not drink but has an alcohol brand for real yeah (laughs) but I believe you when you say I I always now now I can't legally but I'll always have a bottle in my hand trust and believe did you have a hand in marketing the product of course because it says taste what yacht shit is all about (laughs) yes you know I normally wouldn't 
that was that was definitely like shared with me. I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> tout that, but if that's what you want, then great. But like <laughs> even in their help um, in in marketing this project, they're obviously so familiar with me and what I love. And yacht shit is is my shit. <laughs> yacht shit is your shit. Never been on a yacht. Have you? No, never me in life. No. no, dude, we don't. We're not. You're successful. in New York. No, <laughs> you don't have to be. What do you mean? I don't know. The Circle Line, I think, is the closest. <laughs> the what? <laughs> the Circle Line is probably the closest. I don't even know what that <laughs> is. What is the Circle Line? It's just a, a tourist boat that goes around Manhattan. Oh, oh I think I saw that the yeah. other day, and I was like, I want to go on that. It's My, cute. Uh, they it's have cute. like signs that say "Eat Lobster on a Boat." Stuff and I like would that. do that immediately. Every day. So excellent advertising. When I graduated, they held our like senior dance there, but people on were also boat? getting married on the boat. <laughs> what like, they share? We the have boat? ruined this one. That Abs- boat. I would be not big enough. <laughs> fucking pissed if some high schoolers were at my wedding that I did yeah. not know. That's crazy. I mean, that's warning to all of you listening. Do not book yeah. a circle line no. for your wedding. I mean, like, look, all about saving money on your wedding, but don't be that cheap. No, no it's true. Not, like, book, yeah. book that, a yacht. That's actually, like, it's their it's fault. kind of on them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> book a yacht and get Isis Prosecco. That's what you need to do. Exactly. Listen, I like where your head's at. <laughs> but I, I want to talk about the other businesses that you've sort of invested in or promoted. And I know there's Sienna Naturals. Yes. Coffee brand called Hilltop Coffee. What is your kind of investment philosophy? When you look to back, I look to back things that <laughs> things that I love and things that I need, mm-hmm. you know, things that I want. Yeah. Uh, so like Sienna Naturals, I wear my hair naturally a lot and taking care of it is very hard. And I happen to have a sister-in-law who was like testing products to make her hair care line and tested them on me like I was a constant guinea pig. And I watched her do that for a while. And then she was like, do you want in this? And I was like, absolutely. I use the products. You're actually making products for me that work for my hair, for C hair, and have that as a focus. So that was natural. Hilltop, I wanted a coffee shop. Like, I wanted to start a coffee shop specifically because that's where I write, like, constantly. And there was never one in my neighborhood. And I was telling this to my business manager for years. And he found a collaborative partner for me. So there's that. And then, obviously, my love for VRA. So I typically (laughs) collaborate with people, but VRA is something, with the exception of Gala, where it is, like, for sure, like, I'm going all in for this. Right. So you sort of meet people that you like, figure out if there's some synergy, whereas with this one, you obviously found some synergy. Yes. I can't believe I used that word twice. <laughs> no, I Absolutely think that... terrible, but, like... <laughs> it's apt. Yeah, it's out there. <laughs> Keep on the synergy. What else is synergistic that you were going to say? I forgot. You don't remember? I forgot. <laughs> you were so in your head about I know, I know. <laughs> It's because we did an article recently about the worst office oh, taboo shit. words. That's like a March Madness style bracket, and synergy became the number one word. I'm for sure word. guilty of that. Circle uh, back. We circle all back. Are. Yeah, oh. circle back. I don't say. I like intentionally don't say that. I had never heard that phrase until it was used, mm. and then now it's hard for me. Like. Yeah. To not say it. My editor, David Litsky, is always yelling at me. He's like, it's articles, not content. <laughs> and I'm like, that's yeah, actually I so true. I hate content. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Isa, I want to talk about your media company. Hooray. Tell me about growing the business. I mean, beyond changing the name, like, what did you set out to do with the production company? I wanted to make it all-encompassing. Um, I wanted to make an ecosystem, which I'm sure is on your list of overused office <laughs> words. <laughs> but, like, even the expansion of the company mm-hmm. has been an actual progression of things that we were kind of already doing. So, for example, with radio, which is the yeah. audio everywhere company that sits under Hooray, like, that is... One of our main businesses is music supervision, which mm-hmm. was so popular on Insecure, and which was a, an opportunity for me to learn about the business and then Still work with experts. Such a good soundtrack. Oh, thank the you. Insecure soundtrack. Shout out to Kier Lehman, One of the who's best. An incredible <laughs> mentor, collaborator, all those things. And then obviously we, we were doing podcasting just via audio storytelling, and that also falls into it. And then there's the management company, Color Creative, yeah. which started out as an opportunity to find up and coming voices and try to replicate the model that I had with Awkward Black Girl where it's like you create the piece of work and you get people excited about it and hopefully then sell it to a network and so we were funding pilots for the cheap for Mm -hmm. people that we believed in writers that we believed in and then you know that got them noticed and represented but sometimes they would come back to us and be like hey me and Denise who I found a color creative with to be Mm -hmm. like hey you know you guys were so central in 
getting us these opportunities. Like, can you still, like, I have a manager, but can you still help right. us? And so we were like, we should just do this officially. And that's how Color Creative kind of transitioned into a management company uh, run by Talitha now. And so all of these businesses are just extensions of things that we're doing or spaces that we want to get into. Did you always have this kind of entrepreneurial streak? Like, you know, obviously you're an incredible creative and incredible showrunner, but you've set up quite a big business with this. With help. I think it's because of, you know, I'm a, I've always been a, a collaborator in that mm-hmm. way. And so I wouldn't do this if I didn't have capable people that I believed in. But I guess to answer your question, like, I know that that's come from the Internet. I feel like anybody who's created from the Internet has to do so many yeah, things. True. And you have to be savvy in certain areas and, and learn so much. And I think because that was my starting place, like, it so much felt possible. Yeah. You know, and f- it felt attainable. It's just like you're building something from nothing and showcasing it. And so why not replicate that with other areas of the business? So some of Hooray's work includes Rap Shit, the series, but you have some awesome future projects down the pipeline. If I may say so, Nice White Parents is one of my favorite. Oh, podcast is incredible. such a good production. Tell me about that. I mean, it's an incredible podcast. And, you know, we were just excited for the opportunity to turn that into a I lived a block student. away from that school. Are you serious? Oh, really? In Carroll Gardens. Yeah. Well, oh, no I mean, way. until I moved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what a great story. Now it's just about like, how do we tell that story now? Yeah. You know, in, in present day. And so much has changed even since that podcast was done. How do you pick what creative projects you want to focus on? How do you find that IP? Honestly, I mean, I work with an incredible team, so they're always on the lookout and, you know, reading books that haven't been released yet or, you know, reading uh, pitch pages for books that they're interested in. And, you know, I obviously have my own projects that, like, I'm passionate about. And so it's just a matter of sometimes reaching out to the author or talking to agents. It's just being proactive. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So when we interviewed you back in 2017, which is obviously, like, everything's changed (laughs) for you since then. Only a few major things have happened in the world since then. But in the interview, you said you talked about how a black person could never pitch something like Seinfeld, like a show about nothing. (laughs) And I'm curious whether you think the environment or expectation for black creators has changed or not really. Well, now it's changed back. I think it's regressed. Really? A thousand percent post-strike when they're going to do less shows and, you know, now like kind of broaden broaden the scope of what's released, I guess, to maximize audience potential. I think now in that way where we could appeal to niche audiences yeah. before, like, I don't I don't think that that'll be the case. So I stand by that statement <laughs> now because everything has to be super high concept that's going to be made. Like, even I, as a creator, I'm navigating that, you know, like, of what, what I want to make next. And Do you like being in front of or behind the camera? I like being behind the camera. What do you mean? <laughs> like, there's... I like being in front of the camera when it's like... I love ensemble projects I've discovered. Like, I have worked on so many. I can't talk about it, I guess, because it's sad. But I guess in my past, I've worked with a lot of, like, people that I'm fans of. So, like, yeah playing opposite of, you know, a legend like Jeffrey Wright or, you know, Margot and Ryan, like mm-hmm. those th- kind of yeah. things and watching people be in their element. I like that part of being in front of the camera, but I could easily also just watch from behind the camera too. How has the strike affected you? Both the writer's strike and the SAG strike now? Um, I mean, the strike has affected me like it's affected everybody else. Obviously, work stoppage, not being able to talk about projects that I really, you know, I'm proud of and the like, but I stand by it, obviously. Like there's... It, yeah. The, changes that the writers got were like essential and I give so much props to them for having the foresight to see like some of the ills of our industry. Yeah, well some of the AI oh my God, it's, stuff that's yeah, come up is it's insane. So scary. And you know, I wasn't thinking about that and I wasn't thinking about how it would affect the, me as a writer, like the the competition of the industry, and you know, I think studios should also be scared. I think development executives should be scared. I think people who are embracing it should obviously use it wisely, but like just be very aware of what the possibilities are and what that means for like our work and the copyright of of our own work. Is there any way that AI is used that you think could actually be useful, or do you think it's generally like? You know, absolutely. I think if as a writer, if you can sometimes getting something down on the page, like to start, you're sewing your head. And so if you can have a prompt that where you can like dictate, this is what I'm thinking, spit something out like and then you're editing it. Absolutely. That could be a game changer in in terms of just starting, like you know, getting past the intimidation of it. I think that's a really good idea. I'm going to do that with my next draft. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) 
And then, yeah, I think that like anything that kind of makes the industry just more approachable and attainable to, to get started for new writers, for diverse writers yeah. to find opportunities and, and level the playing field, that could be great. But again, it's it could while it could level the playing field, it could also drastically like change the balance of things. You actually just talked about something interesting, which is the fact that you think, you know, especially post-strike, these, you know, stories that might be more niche may get cut out. I'm curious. I want to hear more about that. And then I want to hear a little bit about sort of what other big changes you're seeing going on in the industry. Well, I think the elimination of, I guess, monoculture has for sure affected what determines the success of a series. Like there are clear blatant hits like Netflix will tout Wednesday is a huge success but then there's certain times when you're like oh I don't know where this show where this show lands and now it's canceled so like and then mm. so many of these creators don't even have access to their data and then not only that now that it's taken off the platform like when things started getting taken off platforms yeah I was like oh my god and it made me realize like I have nothing tangible totally I have nothing I don't have maybe I have season one of Insecure on DVD <laughs> Uh, and like, and that was gifted to me. But if my show disappears, who, that's a terrible gift. Like for who gave, whoever gave it to you, <laughs> it was, it, that's like an insane <laughs> gift to give you. <laughs> It was probably like one of my elders. And now, to be fair to them, that's like all I have. That's a physical yeah. representation yeah. of this show. And so my heart goes out to people who are just like, I made all of this. Like, I poured my heart and soul into this and I don't have a copy. And I imagine like networks would be courteous enough to be like, yeah, we took it off the platform. But here you go. Here are all the files. Yeah. But there is something about like having something tangible as a creator that like I have like I'm 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 exploring about how to just leave a mark outside of just the digital footprint that we've been able to have. But I forgot your question because that was Oh, I was just asking about the kind of broad predictions for the industry following the SAG strike. So you know you talked a little bit about niche shows not yes. being yes. You know. I think obviously with less shows that means that like less casting opportunities while the writers were able to fight for more minimums. I mean for minimum staffing rooms for writers. Yeah. Again, there, that means there's less stuff to work on because everything is so expensive. So just less opportunities. I think that there will just be in the same way that the 90s to the 2000s, there were less diverse shows on the air. I think yeah. that that's for sure going to be a casualty of it all. So Ugh, that's, so that's one of the, the bleak. <laughs> so depressing. It is. It is. But we'll see. I mean, it also depends on who's in charge and what people are looking for. But I've honestly already seen it. I've really? Already, yeah, I've seen so many shows go away and you got to give us a show. You got to give us a show that went away that shouldn't have. That shouldn't have. I was actually really sad that the the show about the Lakers got canceled. Oh, oh winning, winning time. time. Winning yeah. time. Didn't get a chance to like thrive. Yeah. And like the the cast on that was so, so talented. Good. So good. And it comes good. from, you know, the brilliant Adam McKay. I'll say Southside. I love yeah. the show oh, yeah. Southside. Though I think Yalo and Bashir are hilarious. And just conceptually, that was something that was like small and very specific. And I was devastated that that got canceled. Yeah. And I also think the weird thing is that so many specific stories still have resonance with people who are not from that community yeah right? absolutely like, and will ultimately inspire you know the next generation of people who want to tell stories so it like it affects the future in some ways too i want to talk about your own creative journey and i'm curious what is the first thing you ever wrote that made you feel like oh this is it like i can do this <laughs> a play in church a play in church yeah was it like the story of Jesus? No, or? it was about, it was like kind of dragging my congregation. Yes. Because <laughs> we had like old so dramatic people. Like it was always drama in our church. And so like I created, a, I, I made a play that was a soap opera. How old were you? I was 11. That's and awesome. And then it was the, um, <laughs> and then the the reverend was just like, oh, that was so good. Like people like seeing it. Oh, on people stage, liked it. People okay. were laughing at themselves. Oh, and, good. People you know, weren't like, yes. I'm going to kill no, this No, they child. were like, ah. <laughs> 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 I'm sure somebody was. I'm sure people like whatever boycotted the church after that. But no, they were very supportive. And like seeing people laugh at jokes that I had written um, was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I want to do this. Did you always feel like, and also, you know, this is like kind of from my personal background, but like I wanted to be a writer forever, but I also know 
that almost sounded like wanting to be an actor. You know I, what yeah. I mean? Like your family's just like, yeah, so law school. Yes, exactly <laughs> that. It, it, um, it feels so intimidatingly unattainable because like so many people yeah. want to do that. And you're just like, yeah. well, what is it about me and my writing that'll stand out and have an opportunity? You know, like why me? But if you want to do it, like what else are you supposed to do? You yeah, know? yeah it's true. I you got to try. Or... You got to try it. I can't pretend like I don't want this. So, yeah. How did you find mentors? I had amazing teachers from high school on, like, and especially in college. Like, I had great teachers who were encouraging. And so when I did feel like, oh, I can't do this. This is an impossible job. Like, they were the ones encouraging me and showing me, like, resources and examples of people who who did make it. And, yeah. you know, who pursued it. And make it has so many different definitions. And for me, I had to determine, like, what that meant to me. Like, what I was satisfied with achieving. My last question for you is you had a memoir come out in 2015, I think, right? Misadventures of Awkward Black Girl. Mm -hmm. A lot has changed in your career since then, but how do you think you have changed as a person? I'm so glad nobody saved my writing from 10 years ago about Um, myself. I'm saying, like, that's... (laughs) Again, the bane of my existence. I'm proud of having written it. But it's so interesting because, like, with some of the, the shows that I've done, like, I can revisit that and be like, oh... I know I've grown and I would do these differently, Mm -hmm. but I'm not going to read my fucking book again. I'm not going (laughs) to look at that. I'm not going through those chapters. So I don't remember a lot of what's in there. I just know that there's stuff that defines me as a, like there were works from when I was like 23 to whatever, 20, I was almost 30 when the book came out, but like the writings were like from 23 to 28 maybe. And so, so much has changed. I'm a different person. I'm so much also, exactly. (laughs) I'm so much more, I guess, obviously confident in myself now. Yeah. And then then even my sense of humor is a bit different, you know? Like I think then, yes, I think I was more, I don't know, like there was also like the edgy time when you're like, you're saying the the craziest thing you could. Classic, classic, like, yeah. And even like, I don't know, I'd I'd like to think that my my humor is just a bit more refined. There's so many obvious jokes in there and I'm just like, girl, shut up. (laughs) I just know they're there. So anytime someone like will screenshot a passage, like I'm reading your book, I'm like, just put it down. But again, I'm proud of That's who awesome. I was. Yeah. <laughs> and buy the book. Yeah. And, and, and buy and the book. Check out my yeah. book in stores. <laughs> Target. <laughs> it is 99% off. <laughs> Drink some Prosecco. Yes. Try and read Curl that book at the same time. <laughs> get through it. No, just get fully in character as a 25 year old. You know, drunk. So only what in. Yeah. <laughs> So it's time to wrap up the show with Keeping Tabs. This yes. is a segment where each of us shares a story, a trend, or a company that we are following right now. And Issa, we're going to start with you because you're our guest. Okay, lucky me. <laughs> <laughs> There's the Love is Blind reunion just came oh out. My God. I need Dude. a community because I don't like my friends. <laughs> jo- I'll some- text you. <laughs> You've come to the right like, place. <laughs> it's just this season was exceptionally bad because yeah. there wasn't like the, the focus on people finding their partners, good people finding their partners just feels like it went out the window for drama. Like the fact that two people knew each other and so, dated in the past. Yeah, there are a lot yeah. of villains this season. I was on the Love is Blind Reddit. I know. I'm sorry, oh, but please, I had to tell find me everything out. and I'm that about to be going off to the dark <laughs> place. So apparently there was like a fourth couple they were following I've and they heard. filmed. Which is the blonde girl who's in like so many random yeah, scenes. The guy, the so, guy who's like, yeah, uh, bought in, uh, like, stocky. Yeah, yeah, stocky guy. But apparently, something like when she said, I don't, he like threatened to kill her. <laughs> the police, sorry, God. I'm laughing because oh. it's like oh. so nuts. So I think they just scrap a lot of that footage. Yeah. And then they recut it in a way where, like, I feel so bad for Aaliyah. She seems like a very nice she person. Seems like, and she's gorgeous. So, like, yeah. that she went through all that. And I props to her because she could have, like, Went through the process just because, but she knew. Yeah, she, she knew who she deserved was. Better. Yeah. yeah, Lydia, villain. Who was the <laughs> Uche? Huge villain. Yeah, just absolutely. Classic guy I would have met age twenty five who would have ruined my life. The reality <laughs> TV show villain turns this past year. Scandaval on Vanderpump. I wish I've always I been know, obsessed that's... with. I've, oh. I've been a Vanderpump <laughs> fan since season two. I've watched it live. Yes, I actually have not. Wa- I've not gotten into Vanderpump. It's it's a it's worth a binge. It is. Yeah. I mean, it was. It's it's like so thirteen seasons. Good. 
Like, okay. just, I'll go back. Just naturally. If you endorse it, then I will go back and yeah. watch it. Yeah, but it was also at the time, so I don't want to. It might be like my book. So, like, I don't want <laughs> to. Oh, it doesn't oh, age well. It does not <laughs> age well. It, it doesn't. But it's really good television, especially knowing that these are real people who are friends who worked in this restaurant. And then, I guess, as, as seasons passed, it was like, well, y'all. They acknowledge, like, we are too rich to work in this restaurant. Yeah. We don't yeah. have to do this anymore. So it just follows yeah, these random follows people. It. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing with selling Sunset. It's just like, you, oh, you don't need, or Below Deck. I was like, you don't need to be, speaking of yachts. Yeah, <laughs> Below Deck, I also watch faithfully. But some of them need to be on that deck. Like, you know, some of them need to be they, on that they, deck. <laughs> they do. They need it. So at least Below Deck, I believe. But selling Sunset, they don't really be selling houses. No, there's no chance. Chriselle doesn't. Chriselle does not work. <laughs> no. Chris is busy, busy with G Flip. <laughs> <laughs> we need a spin off reality TV show podcast because it comes up so yeah, often on this podcast. Because I mean, if you ask me what I'm obsessed with, like that's how like when I get to turn my brain off and just watch oh, yeah. the second screen, like I that's actually it. write first drafts a lot while watching reality TV, which I know sounds insane. I obviously go edit. No, I, things. I, I, I write too with my reality really? TV with show. Really, with playing in the background? Yeah, because you don't I'll click to another tab to read something. You're just like, I have this random thing. I'm watching like yeah. Floor Bama Shore from 2017 or whatever. Real Housewives of Salt Lake City has been like a good binge for me right now. Uh, but you don't. That's on the side. I pay attention to Roni. Okay, I was gonna say because you, I need to pay attention. No, it's just background. Write. Just washes. There's over some me. that are like selling that for sunset. Me. There's I mean, some how much that is I gonna happen on selling sunset? Well, whenever they show the houses, that's when I tune out. I'm like, yeah, I don't yeah. Care. I'm like, I can't afford this. Yeah, that was like, the point. No <laughs> and things. nor can the people that they're showing it to. Let's yeah, be honest. Co- please. It's like, do, Talk do you want to buy yeah. this fifty-seven million dollar yeah. mansion in the hills? And they're always thinking about it. Uh, yeah, I'll come back to you on it. Like, I no. love when they have like the randomest celeb cameos like Tay Diggs came That's on. That's exactly like, what yeah. I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Was that Tay Diggs post or yeah, yeah, it must have been post Adina Menzel, right? A hundred percent. Yeah, because he was, was like looking for ago. a bachelor pad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Good for Tay Diggs. I love Tay Diggs <laughs> Josh, so much. <laughs> Josh, a big theater nerd, so you just Oh, like, yeah, yeah. Oh. I, I went to school for musical theater to begin with and then switched to journalism. So somehow <laughs> yeah, what a sustainability. <laughs> the theater Theater kid to journalist pipeline is strong. It's yeah, too, I, it's it's too it strong. Is. I have seen several examples of that. You it's guys, wild. you're in good company. Yep. Josh, what are you keeping tabs on? George Santos. This, <laughs> My this, face. Speaking <laughs> of sociopaths, this guy, uh, for those who weren't watching last Friday, he walked out of some congressman's office. It's, it's Tim something. Who, it doesn't matter. Some Republican congressman's office with a baby. <laughs> and when asked, is that your baby? His answer was not yet. Yep. <laughs> Which is the best answer he could have given. Well, do you in this remember situation. his tweet? Do you remember how he announced that he got yes, married? Yes. Yeah. He was, was like, like R.I.P. Diane Feinstein, here's my husband. Yeah, or basically, my <laughs> husband and I are devastated. I don't know. But it was like, all right, soft launch, hard launch, I guess. Yeah, hard launched a husband <laughs> and a and a baby that he stole, maybe. We still don't know where this baby came from. I love him. I'm so tired of him. I'm He's really <laughs> what's wrong That's the correct with answer. This fucking <laughs> I know. Country and our politics, yeah, by far. But you know what? Twitter has been social media has been, I mean, just like a nightmare this week. Like truly, just murder. Like so many bad opinions, so much all bad, the time. That, I don't and mean, that was like a bright spot for me. I was like, <laughs> we we all think this is funny. Listen, not all you know? heroes wear caves. Sometimes you need. He's George gonna become Santos an icon with- though. Like in the same way, he might. But the the terrifying version is like he has you know, the path to presidency. <laughs> like, that's That's it. true. So you I'm know, like, persecute yeah. him now and then make him a hero. Please give him consequences and then elevate him, <laughs> him to icon <laughs> status. He's going to be like Rod Blagojevich. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Rod Blagojevich. Says, oh, God, this is too, it's so much of a rabbit Seems hole. Seems so tame. Wait, who is this? Remember the disgraced Chicago mayor who ended up on The Apprentice? Yeah, he was the governor of Illinois, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah he was the governor of Illinois. Oh, my he had, like, the crazy God. hair. He took it back. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. We've been through so so much shit that I forgot. I know wow. that's the thing. You hear about him, you're like, Damn. that seems fine. Yes. <laughs> Rob Lagojevich, Anthony Weiner, aka Carlos Danger. <laughs> that was a whole thing. That's yeah, why his name did it for him. Like he was set up <laughs> at birth <laughs> <laughs> for his You destiny. can't survive as Tony Weiner. You yeah. can't. Yeah. Make Tony, it as Tony, Tony Weiner. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Uma <laughs> Abedin's always reminded me kind of of my mom. Yeah. <laughs> like, who did? She's so his wonderful. wife, Uma oh. Abedin. Yeah. I was always yeah. like, ah. Oh. 
I hope you're doing okay. Yeah, it's that's tough. She has a new book out that's actually Does very, she? very good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. You read her book. Uh, she <laughs> was on um book. she was on another one of our podcasts on oh, okay. the side. So that was we did so yeah. let's be clear. <laughs> but it was a very, very good book. Okay. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Recommend that's on Josh's book club, apparently. Uh yes, what's your keeping tabs? So we're obviously in a full blown mental health crisis as exhibited by this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Like That's a shot at me. Don't put that on me. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, just going to be bad for Josh. asking you what kind of drunk you are. Yeah. <laughs> Someone let Josh have a podcast. Um, and Harvard University has launched a big initiative to try and combat it, and that is to get mental health influencers on TikTok, which just seems... So you know, backwards. Let's be real. The best way to improve your mental health is to go on social media. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. They're trying to go the way of like derm doctors, which have like a moment oh, on TikTok yeah. right now. Pimple All the dermatologists removing ingrown toenails, but for mental health, not what? So much. Uh, Josh. Oh, Josh. Man. Oh, we don't need to Josh. go down. We don't. Need I don't want to go down, go down, down that route, please. <laughs> let's, let's end it there. I feel like Josh really, Josh really killed Josh really killed the conversation. Issa just, just walked out of the room. She's, she's <laughs> gone. No, come back. Get Issa's Prosecco. <laughs> That's the best way to deal with mental health. Drink. Drink. Thank you, Issa. An Issa. announcement from Issa Ray. Drink Prosecco and you'll feel better. <laughs> That's it for most innovative companies. Issa, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. This was I so hope, much fun. I hope you can get drunk at the end of the day. I will, since we couldn't do it here because you didn't pick your idea, but it's fine. Now that I know that you don't drink, it's, I forgive you. <laughs> our show is produced by Avery Miles and Blake Odom, mixed and sound designed by Nicholas Torres, and our executive producer is Josh Christensen. <laughs> Not for much longer. <laughs> yeah. Remember, again, to subscribe, rate, and review, and we will see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>